There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She played Jelly Lorem and Griddlebone in the 1987 third U.S. national tour. So welcome, Joanna Beck, and thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. I am very excited to talk to you because I have talked to some Jelly Lorems before, but not to anybody who's done Griddlebone. So we'll get there. Um, we'll ask all my crazy questions about your character. But what I'd love to first start with is just that your history with cats. I mean, it's, it's when you were on the third U S national tour, it was when it was just starting to kind of tour around um, the United States. So what did you know about the show before being cast in it? Did you, were you aware of it? Was it, you know, has it, was it starting to pick up its lore at that time? Oh, it was a huge hit. Uh, when it, when it came on Broadway in 80, I think it was 81. Mm -hmm. And I saw it on Broadway because I was living in New York at the time and pursuing theater. And uh, so I saw it, Had actually had a, a friend who's one of the understudies, got to see Betty Buckley do Grisabella. Wow. So I, I saw the original, pretty mm -hmm. much the original cast. And um, just knew it was a huge hit and was something that looked like a tremendous amount of fun to be a, be a part of. So, it, but it was a few years later that because I went out on tour with Showboat with Donald O'Connor and then came back in and did and did um, did that on Broadway, and this was actually in eighty five that we we went out on this tour from eighty five to eighty seven, mm -hmm. and um, or or was it eighty seven to eighty nine? No, it was eighty five to eighty seven, I believe, and. Uh, I was actually in an audition for something else entirely. And uh, Andy Zerman, who was casting director, one of the casting directors for uh, Johnson Liff, uh, asked me to come and audition for Cats. So uh, I did. I was not, I wasn't pursuing it. I, I don't think, you know, it wasn't, I was just going to any auditions. <laughs> That's what mm -hmm. you did. You yeah. just went to audition for anything you could. And, um, Five auditions later, I got a phone call that they wanted me to do Jelly Lorem and Griddlebone. Five auditions. Wow. Five callbacks. That is a rigorous process. It was a rigorous process. Yeah. But, but there were a lot of people. I mean, there were, there were people. This was when you stood in line to sign up for an audition, and you were there very early in the morning, and the lines went around the block. So there were a lot of people wanting to, to do, be in that show. And what was that show like from crowd reaction standpoint? Because this is, again, it was something so unique, so different. And it's the first time <laughs> most people are seeing it uh, for, you know, experiencing this on tour because you're going city to city and really introducing it unless someone happened to see Broadway or a version of, um, you know, I think it was in L.A., there was only a couple versions before your tour. What kind of crowd reaction did you did you get? Like, what was the lore of it at that point? You mean the crowd reaction on tour? Yeah, in in, in the in eighty seven, eighty five to eighty seven. It was um, completely sold out. I don't think in the two years we maybe had one week that was not completely sold out. Wow! It was people really wanted to see it. I'm not sure if they wanted to see it because they were curious or whether they had heard about it, whether they had heard the music, whether they had seen it, you know, on Broadway or what. But they, they, the crowds showed up, standing ovations all the time. Um, and it just packed. I mean, we were in, I think it was St. Louis Muni outside mm -hmm. <laughs> in the summer. And I think that, I think it had something like 12,000 seats. It was sold out every night. That is pretty amazing. Um, what what did they tell you about Joey Lorem? About the backstory? I mean, do you remember the the information you were given on the character 
and how to like, you know, how to play her. Cause again, this is pretty early on. There's not, you know, now there's 40 years worth of examples and, and right. multiple movies and everything else that there's, there's a little bit more um, for the actors to work with I, at that point. I mean, you were kind of basing it off of pretty much two or three productions that you had right. and, and what was told to you. So I'm curious what, what was told. Sadly, I don't really remember. Oh, no. What was told to me. I mean, I, I don't remember that we were told a lot about our, our backstories. I think that David Taylor pretty much left us alone to create our own stories. I know that we had about three days solid of just doing cat improvs. Wow. Literally crawling around on the floor with each other doing cat improvs. I mean, it was fun. I would go home. I had two cats in my apartment and I would go home and get on the floor and just, you know, watch them intently to, to just to see what they did and just get, catch their movements. And uh, I know that sounds pretty silly, but it was it was actually sort of fun. <laughs> it's, you know, it sounds silly, but I've talked to the 2016 cast who did the same, who a lot of them said the same thing. It's like the minute they were uh in tune to that that experience they did a similar type of of i think they called it validity school um they they would see a cat on the street and would think the same thing so I, it is kind of a unique piece of the show what story did you write because if you got to create what how would you describe joey Lerm's backstory well i was probably the i think if i remember this correctly the next oldest cast member Okay. But, yeah. So I used that in in the show as being one of the older cats. So I was very much uh, the mothering type of cat, very protective of the kittens. Um, and then I also used that with Gus, very protective mm -hmm. of Gus. Um, so that's sort of how it created, and then it just evolved, and. The way it's choreographed is also has a lot to do with probably your stories that you can create. Mm -hmm. Because if you're choreographed and you're not necessarily with certain cats on stage, then you don't really interact with them. Yeah. And much. I think I think that's where a lot of these rumors come from. That, yeah. you know, there's a very deep rumor mill for cats of which cats just, are together. I find and, that so funny. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's very funny. It's where I'm able to piece together. Again, I, I saw the show twice. I saw it in 2016 and then 2017, I think. Yeah. Um, and I've seen the 1998 movie. And that's it. And yeah. so there is a little bit of the how do I piece together this story? And a lot of it comes from this, like, quote unquote, rumor mill. And, and that's a part that I think is kind of a, a, a fun part to this, this show, but it also is where I think I've, the more I've thought about, it, the more I've learned, it's a lot of it is because it's just like the, your friends with somebody before or after, or it's because of staging or dance numbers or the interactions that you have in your particular production. And so obviously there's a lot of ties for Joey Lauren and Gus because yeah. of, of the song. Is there any other relationships that you remember that you thought from just purely from a cat side of like, okay, I might be this cat's brother or sister, or we have some special relationship? Pounceful was my, uh, my son. Pounceful was your son. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pounceful was my son. He was one of the ones that I, and I, I have no idea how much Jelly got around yeah. <laughs> in terms of, but I'm sure that probably some of the other kittens could easily have been mine also. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, th that is kind of, I think, a fun part of the rumor mill is that it's like, you could probably make an argument that most of the, that are supposed to be the older cats are very potentially the parents of pretty much all the other right. kittens. Right, right. So yeah, you, I would I would think Monka Strap and I probably had some some kittens together. Okay. No. <laughs> so you and you and Monk. What about Bustifer um, and you? I doubt it. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I doubt it. Uh, Bustifer could more have been my brother. Ooh, that. So I asked this question because I think there's an uh, there is a rumor that potentially Jelly and Bustifer are together or have been together. Oh. And that Grizz and Bustifer has also been together. 
and one of like Grizz and you and Joey Lorm are, are friends from growing up. And so there's a little bit of like what happened in that scenario. Oh, well that, see, I did now I, I, my relationship with Grizz was a lot sort of hands off, I guess is, is maybe the best way to say that. Mm-hmm. Cause I never felt, um, I felt a lot of empathy for her, but I did not feel like there was a connection that goes, went back. Okay. So you, you played more of like, you you know who she is. You're not friends from growing up. Maybe much younger, but I think, I think she was older than me. Okay. I think Grizz was uh, older than Kelly. That is yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because again, it's it's everything you read is it's like you just never know. It depends on <laughs> you. Who. Don't well, it's whatever you want it to be. That's true. That is true. <laughs> I think that's some of the beauty of of the show is is that it can be interpreted and done so many different ways, and you get a yeah. different. So everyone sees it slightly different. What um what other pieces do you remember about like the backstory that you were not maybe not for Joey Lauren, but just overall the story of Cats you were told because that's a piece I think is so challenging is is that the plot is so loose well to me i think it's actually sort of simple it is a gathering of a tribe old deuteronomy is the head of the tribe Mm -hmm. and it's we come together to present to deuteronomy i heard somebody say that we Cho- help chose who went to the heavy side layer, and, and that was never my understanding. It was always Deuteronomy's choice. I've never heard somebody say that you choose. I've always heard it's all oh. Deuteronomy. Oh yeah. Well, I don't. Why did I? I don't know where I got that, but somewhere along the way, I thought I heard somebody say, somebody that, say that? that we, you know, that we all got together to choose who went to the heavy side layer. Oh, uh, I mean, at this point, I believe any rumor about the show. So, <laughs> but it was basically a gathering of the tribe for those about, you know, almost like a family reunion Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But during that period of time is when we presented our choices for who we thought should be chosen to go to the heavy side layer. And so you're presenting And during the whole process of that, there was lots of celebration and lots of reuniting and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're presenting Gus, basically saying, I I think Gus Gus is the choice. And what about all the kittens that present? Are they just trying to steal the spotlight or do they actually think they have a chance? They, they're they just like a lot of us. They feel like they have an opinion that needs to be heard. Mm-hmm. So that's it. They're, yeah. they're trying to just make sure that they're. Yeah. That they're, you know, why, why shouldn't my opinion be heard just like anybody else's? Mm-hmm. So tell me about your relationship with Gus. You're obviously presenting him. What, how does that come to life? How, how does my, how how do you become the one to present Gus? I guess is really like, what, what is the relationship? Like, why does Gus not present himself completely? I don't think Gus was capable of presenting himself really. I mean, although he does have his song that Mm -hmm. he sings, but I also think that he, um, you know, I, I had to really egg him on to get out there to, to sing his song and to present his his story. Uh, so I just think he was at an age where without that, he would just have been happy to sit back and just watch. Just, just watch just and not watch. be part of it. And not be, no, not be part of it. He He was proud of his background and was happy to tell anybody about his background and what he had accomplished. Mm -hmm. But he had gotten, I guess maybe senile is a, is a word to describe him a little bit. Okay. And, and so my uh, caring for him was to encourage him. I was an encourager for him to, to get him to come on, relive this for us and let them see who you really are or who you were. Okay, so you're you're basically it's that you know choice is being made. You think Gus deserves a choice, mm-hmm. and so you're. But he doesn't even want to go up. He's like, I, I'm tired. I just want to watch. 
And so you're kind of trying to push him along. And so that's right, how you're... because he, you know, uh, uh, well, at least the way Richard and I did it, mm-hmm. uh, and some of those were Richard's Richard's choices that I uh, played along with or just, you know, fed into. Um, he, there was a lot of hesitancy there. Mm-hmm. I really had to almost literally push him forward to yeah. to sing his his part, and it, so, and and the hesitancy in the vocal, uh, the song itself, you know, was indicated that he wasn't really anxious to do this. Yeah. The other kind of interesting part about your, your character is, is that you do griddle bone. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's not something, it was something that was loosely thrown into the most recent movie like the the Hollywood movie, it was not in the revi- Broadway revival. So tell me about that whole, like that whole section of the musical, because it's not something I have a lot of frame of reference for. I'm sorry you didn't get to see that because I, it, it was one of, it was just fun, just mm-hmm. a tremendous amount of fun. So Gus becomes Growl Tiger. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then of course he's on the ship with all of the pirates and here comes Griddlebone, who is, I thought of her somewhat as like a Mae West kind of character. Okay. And, but yet, at the same time, if you think, if you listen to the music of it, operatically, it's a, it's the definitive dueling tenor and soprano. Be- Interesting. Yeah. And, and the premise is essentially, this is Gus reliving his... Gus Glorious. reliving one of his roles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of his roles. And you get to kind of play a part in it. Right, right. Because I'm, uh, here comes the soprano, and I don't know if you're how much opera you've ever seen. But Very little. There, <laughs> Very little. <laughs> there can be a lot of competition between a tenor and a soprano. And that's, we just, we just took that and went with it and made it a huge comedy routine. Wow. Wow. Uh, um, that's a fun. That's a fun kind of piece of this. I feel like again, the the lore of the show is is that there's so many different angles to it that it's something that loosely again was loosely brought in to the 2019 movie, but wasn't in the revival. And there's other kind of pieces. So, uh, I, I how do you think like what is that transition like? Because that's kind of like in the same song. Like how does that like how do you handle that like two different kind of characters and quote unquote roles when you're doing a show like that? Well, I was, I literally, Gus was sitting on a can, basically. Mm -hmm. He goes and sits back down on a can or gets up and he gets up from the can and goes and his cape that he had on, which was a scraggly thing, he he gets it off and he, he literally has blow up arms like Popeye that come i take the can and go off stage make a costume change and i literally most places went to the back of the house and came down the aisle wow and made a whole i mean it was a whole different entrance because i had you know it was like the conjuring cat i left on at one place and i showed up in another place so how challenging was that in most of these theaters? Because I have heard some <laughs> horror stories in some of these theaters that getting to the back of the house from the front of the house is, is a you know almost a crawl or a very, very difficult task. On tour, how did you solve that each week? Well, it had been planned out prior to us getting there. The, the stage manager, of course, had put together that route that I was to take. There were only a few places where I couldn't do it, and I had to just somehow come down to the front of the house and maybe go up some steps or something. But most of the time, I was able to get around to the... Well, it's the same way we did Green Eyes. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the show, when you do Green Eyes, you come from the back of the house down to the stage, and then you go back and get backstage, because most theaters have entrances to stage right and stage left, in the audience, at the edge of the audience. So, you know, I would either come that way or another back way. Dressers were phenomenal. They had, I mean, I literally had maybe a minute and a half to do this or two minutes. Maybe it was a little longer than that. And I ran 
But when you're doing this show eight times a week, your stamina gets built yeah. up pretty pretty well. It's, it is it's a, just it's a pretty amazing a performance. Yeah, it is uh-huh. uh, quite an athletic feat. But I would go around, and it went over top of my other costume because those unitards, you know, you you couldn't get out of them. Mm-hmm. So it it was another unitard that went on top of my unitard, but it was just laid out to the point where I had to sit down. They th- threw it on me tied my shoes, put another wig, big, huge. I don't know if you've, you've seen pictures of her mm-hmm. and uh, put that on my head, put the gloves on my hand with these long fingernails and off I went. Was there any place where it was like a really crazy route that you like had to like go through a bathroom in a crawl space or anything like that? No, because that, that you, that wouldn't have been able, it wouldn't have been possible. No, it wouldn't have been because, doable. because of the, you didn't have enough time to do something like that. So if the, if there were places like that, that's when you just came down and went up the stage okay. and it's dark. So they just hit you with a spot and, yeah. and, and you do, you know, the first line, which is her, it's an Italian, it's chi è la, an Italian. And, and then she, that's when she and growl tiger start their, their little dueling duet that's that's so fun i i I have to find a better version of that on the internet to watch of like of that scene because it's i have yet to find a good one or at least like a a really strong one to be able to kind of piece that together because it's not again not part of the storyline that i i knew as much about is Um, it in the is it not in the london cast version that's on dvd the 1998 version it it might be but I will tell you, I've only I've seen that one time all the way through, and the other mm-hmm. times I've seen it in pieces. So maybe I need to just fast forward. We'll just go that watch the see. top of the second act. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need to I need to just push it all the way through and go and go watch it. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about the fundraiser that you did recently, but also the fundraiser you did on tour in, in the '80s. So tell me a little bit about the you know the fundraiser on tour. And what that kind of led to with the most recent one, I think you did it. It's, it's coming up on a year um, that you, maybe not that close. No, we did it not. We did October. it in October. Yeah, it was, so it was somewhere around. It was around October Halloween or something. Yeah. October of twenty twenty. Yeah. Right. Um, the first one that we did, I wasn't a part of, and I'm trying to remember why. Um, but I wasn't a part of the first one. The sec. I remember the second one that we did. Lily Tomlin was on stage with us at one point, and, I'm, and I want to say it was in, possibly in D.C. Jonathan could tell you more about that. He remembers those details a lot better mm-hmm. than I do. Well, the first one was Kansas City. I know that. That was the big, the very first one. But yeah. then, it, and then it continued for a while. So the second one was, you said you think it's D.C., and that Some, was you were yeah. on stage. Okay. Yeah, because I remember singing uh, Make Our Garden Grow from Candide. And, okay. uh, which is a huge number. And interestingly enough, that was the show that Chris Toy and Mark Agnes and I were all doing right before we got all got hired to do cats. So, so you were reliving old parts. I was reliving you know, old parts, but, um, it's, uh, th- that was a, just a fabulous opportunity to get to do something different and to raise money for a good cause, mm-hmm. but to um, just spend our time I- in a way that would help others. Yeah. I think that is a part that I've talked to a, a few people from your cast, and it, it's such an amazing cause. And like, a, and at the time, you know, an amazing, huge fundraiser yeah. um, for, for the amount raised, at, you know, at what the value of the dollar at that time, just like, you know, if you do the math today, it's, it's an incredible fundraiser. Yeah. I, I'm blown away that you would do eight shows a week on tour and in your spare time also rehearsing other shows. And so how did you, I mean, find the time to do that? How did you manage as someone who can't perform, sing or dance or do anything? I just like imagine you doing your show eight times a week and then trying to sing. I guess it makes a little sense that it was a previous role. So you knew a lot more of it, but learning all these other numbers and songs and, um, and settings, how, how difficult is that to do? Well, I think of the one in Kansas City where that was based on a chorus line. Mm-hmm. And most everybody knew the new, you know, it's, you know, the shows, you may not 
you, you may need to do a little bit of work in terms of memorization. But you basically know the show anyway. And of course, but choreography, that's a whole different story. But um, these dancers, they do it all the time, every day, every year, for years and years and years. And you can somebody can throw a combination at you and you pick it up right away just simply because that's what you do all the time. As a singer, you somebody throws you a piece of music and you sing through it a couple of times and you may not have it memorized, but you, you probably know it, basically. Yeah. Just because you do it all the time. That's such a skill and talent, and that's what's like so fascinating to see. I mean, which makes sense. It's everyone kind of at the peak of their field, doing this and being able to to do something that's you know seems so challenging, but you know it's just kind of second nature. Well, but I think that's with any uh, field. For sure, you do it when you do it every day. It just does become second nature to you. Mm-hmm. And then tell me a little bit about the October kind of reunion, I guess, uh, <laughs> fundraiser. That was just so much fun and such an incredible blessing. It was, we just, the first time we were all on a Zoom meeting together, it was like, I think we sat there and just laughed because it was just so great to see people that we had not seen in years. Uh, we've, we've had a, a couple of little smaller reunions, but it wasn't with as many people as were on this Zoom call and, and who's, who were joining in to do this. It was a challenging thing to do mm-hmm. because everybody had to, I mean, had to sing and record themselves separately. And uh, bless his heart, I don't know how Brian put that all together, but he's a genius. <laughs> um, yeah, to, to, to stitch everything together because you recorded yeah. it. I mean, it was all done individual and then it's this beautifully put together piece. And Not and, to uh, mention that song is hard. Yeah. And when you had not sung it in 30 years... I, it was that I had to I had to sing through it quite a few times to try to get it back into my voice, but it was just a lot of fun, just a lot of fun. That's that is it's, it was such a cool thing to watch too, and I, and I love that the the fundraising actually still is still going, and the link is still open, so links in the description for anybody that can donate because it is such an amazing cause. Um, let's do some rapid fire. And I want to get to my kind of million dollar question. I love that, the whole premise of the show. And I'm curious to hear your take, especially as someone who def- who defended uh, Gus's honor in this. But before we get there, if you were not uh, Joey Lorem and Grinnell Bone, which cat would you want to play if you could just pay- be anybody? Victoria. Victoria. You want to do the, the incredible dance number? And- I, yeah, I, I started ballet when I was six years old. And I, at, some, at one point, thought I might dance for a living but when but then when I realized that I probably wouldn't be able to sing because that's you you have to put on blinders I think to dance it's just got to be your total focus Mm -hmm. then um I just said well I'm just going to be the best dancer I can be but I also I need to sing also yeah but if I if I would give anything to do that solo to be able to do that solo yeah, it is a it's just memorable part. Yeah, it's such an and incredible And Joanne Hunter, thing. was to watch her do that every night was sheer heaven. Yeah, it's a, a an, an incredible part of the show. It's definitely a, a piece that is super memorable. And mm-hmm. um, that was the, I was close enough. Uh, I was pretty close to the, you know, not had great seats the first time I saw because I saw a preview. I just remember sitting there watching that going, that looks so hard. Like, oh, yeah. so oh, difficult to do. That that takes is yeah, it's astounding. Who is your favorite and least favorite character? Gus is probably my favorite, and McCavity is probably my least favorite. Okay, so you stick with the yeah. Gus is the the person you're defending always, and then you you don't like the yeah. you don't like the bad guy. Yeah, I I I love yeah. I have a deep deep love for Gus, and and McCavity just. I have a hard time with anybody who, well, it's like a mama bear, It's yeah. you know, d- defending her cubs. Anybody that tries to hurt any of the tribe, yeah, I don't, I don't, I have a problem with that. I have found it so interesting that most of the cast members I've talked to answer 
at, with the lens of their character because you probably played it so long. Whereas for me, I'm as who's someone who's not been any particular cat. I'm always just like, well, yeah, here's why I don't like this one. Or here's why I love this one. And it has no reference to like, oh, because I would, I'm a jelly. I probably would think this way. And I've, I've really found that like you spend so much time in that character that it does oh. influence your, your decisions there. What about favorite song? It's interesting. The one that would stick in my head the most that, that I would, st- was Mr. Mistopolis. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, same same name over and over again. Well, well, that and there was just a joyousness about it, about him. That's a very interesting one because it is such a fun, upbeat, loving song. Right. The one that got stuck in my head when I saw it the first time was Mungo Jerry and Rumble Teaser. Mm -hmm. And the one that gets stuck in my head now, or like the one I sing the most now and and sings the wrong term, I like just hum because I can't sing, is McCavity. It's stuck in my head all the time. That's a that's a great song. That's yeah. just that's a that is a great song. I love again. I love hearing because there's no really wrong answer. It's kind of fun to hear a bunch of people's different takes to it. Yeah. Um, here's here's a uh, question that I, I love asking, and and I'll it's more of a personality of the cat's character. So there's two parts to it. Which cat do you think would be in their element? So like thriving in 1987, and which cat do you think would be in their element thriving in uh, 2021, 2021? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. We would be thriving. Yeah, so if you stuck this character's personality in that era, who would who would be doing the best? Like if we think about 1987 and we think about today, which cat do you think is, you know, you plop them into that and their personality is just living their best life? 87 would be Tugger. Rock star, rock star, just living it up. Okay, yep. I love that answer. Um, what about today, syllabub comes to mind. Syllabub, why syllabub? I don't think anyone said syllabub for this answer because of what we've gone through mm-hmm. the, in the, the in this in the past year. I would equate that with, you know, how she goes to Grizabella. She's the one that reaches out mm-hmm. to Grizabella because of her heart. Her loving, her loving heart. I I do think that there's a lot of merit to that. So you're saying because she's so thoughtful, and like she'd be taking care of everybody. She'd be the mm-hmm. one trying to make mm-hmm. sure everyone during the pandemic is mm-hmm. safe and healthy and mm-hmm. doing what they need to do. That's right. a, yeah, that's a great answer. I I've always taken a different route, which I've always said Bustifer because it just seems like a a kind of uh, a slightly obese cat who just consumes a lot at home. Is probably doing fairly well. Doing very well at home. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. So in in her element, if you say if you use the phrase in her element, Mm -hmm. then it seems like syllabub gets to be her authentic self. That is true. That's very true. So here is my million dollar question. (laughs) <laughs> and it's what I've argued this whole premise of this podcast is I've argued that I don't think Grizabelle was the right jellical choice. So I'd love to hear if you defend Grizabella and if and why. And if not, who would you make as your jellical choice if you get to be uh, influence old Deuteronomy? You know, I think Grizabella was the correct choice. I, uh, I'm surprised. I was waiting for you. I mean, you you present Gus. I was waiting for a Gus he would, argument. He would but. be well. He would be my obviously my second choice. But Grizabella was most the one that was most in need of grace and restoration and forgiveness and all of those things that you think about as someone being lifted up to the heavy side layer. So. The whole argument you think is still that she need, is because of need that she is going. And, and you think she has more need than, than Gus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gus wasn't ostracized like she was. Gus, Gus was applauded and loved and adored. But, but isn't he, he just got his he, last leg? Yeah, he got old. He got old. But he, he didn't need the restoration that she did. I think I actually, you know, think about it in terms of if you look at um, Mary Magdalene or the woman mm-hmm. at the well, 
Mm-hmm. That's who I compare her to. I have always understood the redemption story. Mm-hmm. I have never. I I think it's kind of an interesting one of like because she wasn't even there, and she's returning on that. Oh, evening. I think she was there. Oh, you think so? You think she was part of the? I tribe think she was part? in the. I think she was in the back in the uh, you know hiding in dark place. She was in a dark place. Okay, so you're saying she's kind of been around the tribe for a while still, yeah. and she's back, and she's just it's just time. Yeah. They don't present it that way as much, or maybe that's not the way I interpreted it, is that she's like returning for the first time because everyone seems so shocked to see her. You, because you don't see her very often. She keeps I, – I always thought she just kept to herself, and she didn't feel like she deserved to mm-hmm. be around the, the rest of the tribe. There's, I think the best part about doing this podcast is that there's so many different ways. And this is, a, again, I think this is the probably the literal translation of the show is, is that it is a redemption story and it's about forgiveness and and her return or her you know being there and coming back. I, I've loved that so many people have made other arguments and beyond me. Um, and that there's just so many ways to look at the show because I, you know, I, I think you even saying that she's been there the whole time is not the way a lot of people look at her. It's very different than the way a lot of people look at it. Well, I think that she's just, again, she's an outcast. And mm-hmm. so she has, uh, and again, felt just un- totally undeserving. But uh, she was brought back into the fold. Mm-hmm. And the gives, gives everything she can. Yeah. Um, this has been so fun. To oh, me too. Thank you for doing this. Relive the 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 glory of the show and and everything you've done in the fundraiser. So, um, any parting words about cats? That you think the you know the the masses need to know? No, I think that um, people need to go and look at cats as if without any expectations. Basically, mm-hmm. you go and just with an open mind and enjoy it. And let the music wash over you and watch the incredible choreography and in, enjoy that by itself. If you, you know, if you have to have an explanation for everything, then I think you're, um, I think you're missing the magic. I think that was one of the biggest challenges of the show for me as someone who likes a neat and tidy plot yeah. and story and didn't get that. Um, but also appreciated, you know, everything I saw. Yeah. Um, and so I think it is good sound advice to when the show comes back and it will, it will keep going. There's no it way. Eventually it eventually will. It yeah. will eventually be back. Um, that you can watch it from that lens and, and appreciate it and, um, and enjoy the show and to not go in and try to spend 50 plus episodes trying to figure out the plot of on a podcast, but to just go and, and enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy it for what it is and and what it is is going to be different for everybody who watches it well thank you again for being here thank you and thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of the wrong cat died the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe to follow along you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify stitcher or anywhere else you listen to podcasts follow us on twitter and instagram at the wrong cat died or check out our website the wrong cat died.com